Okay, fantastic. I think we are coming up to be ready to go for our next session, uh, which is intergenerational justice and the rate of committed prosecutions. Um, so thank you so much to everyone who is joining us for this session, both um, here in person and online. I'm really, really excited for this session. We have a fantastic lineup of um, contributors. And more broadly, welcome to Permafrost Day. This is um, the third session in a whole day program where we are covering the local to global implications of thawing ground across the permafrost region. Um, and to give a little bit of initial context, permafrost is permanently frozen ground. Um, and this is a storehouse, a frozen storehouse, which contains almost twice as much carbon as the atmosphere. And in fact, that's more than twice as much carbon as every tree across the face of the planet. And when permafrost begins to thaw, the carbon rich material that it contains is no longer protected. It's no longer safe from the process of decomposition. This means it begins to break down and to release carbon and it will then continue to do so for centuries. So fundamentally, this means that any level of warming above pre-industrial levels will result in future permafrost emissions. And this is a justice issue. It's a justice issue because those who are most vulnerable to the local impacts of permafrost thaw have contributed the least to the problem whether they are local and indigenous Arctic communities whose land is very directly affected um, already by permafrost thaw, or communities elsewhere who are on the front lines of climate change, um, which will be accelerated by those emissions from thawing permafrost. It's also a justice issue because of the long-term nature of permafrost emissions. Decisions that we make now, including here at COP, will influence permafrost emissions um, for a hundred years or more. This means that an action now only increases the burden on young people and future generations, which is why it's so important that we center youth in these conversations. So we're gonna start off with um, a few short presentations and interventions, and then we're gonna move into a panel discussion. So to start us off with a little bit of context, um, deeper context to this issue, um, I want to invite Gustav Hugelius, who is Vice Director of the Berlin Center of Climate Research to um, take the podium. Thank you. Thank you very much for that nice in introduction, Rachel. Um, so as Rachel mentioned, I will be introducing the topic focusing mainly on the permafrost system, so the sort of natural science aspect and feedbacks in the permafrost system. Um, so you see my title here, what we find is permafrost thaw triggered by current emissions will cause sustain ad sustained added emissions for centuries. Uh, and this is the fundamental problem, not just emissions, but the damage to the permafrost system itself that also impacts local, uh, local communities and, and ecosystems. So we have the permafrost carbon feedback or the permafrost thaw feedback where global warming at the top thaws permafrost. In this case, you see the the head wall or the retreating wall of a retrogressive thaw slump, a real dramatic permafrost thaw feature from the Canadian coast. Uh, and what happens when previously frozen carbon becomes exposed to the warmer temperatures where microbes start to break down this organic matter and release greenhouse gases as a byproduct, CO2 and methane predominantly. Uh, but this is not, the, of, of course, the only impact of permafrost thaw. You also have severe impact to ecosystems to infrastructure and not the least to human activities and you know for the people that have been living on these lands for 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 centuries and longer and this whole feedback accelerates and permeates for several centuries even if we stop our emissions relatively soon so this is you know, an urgent matter that also carries uh, m many generations into the future uh, we already heard a little bit about this but the the magnitude of this problem is tied to the magnitude of the permafrost carbon pool. Permafrost covers really large areas. It's about 15 million square kilometers that, are, that, that is frozen. That's three times the size of the European Union. Uh, and this vast amount of frozen ground also holds really vast amounts of old plant and animal remains that have been freeze-locked in time over you know, millennia, but that are now slowly starting to thaw. The sizes of all of these bubbles are proportional to the size of these carbon pools. And these are all of the sort of reactive carbon pools in the global carbon cycle. Uh, you have the atmosphere, which is close to 900 petagrams by now. Uh, this, this number is all in petagrams or gigatons of carbon. So these are not numbers for 
if you were on the uh, recalculated to CO2, you would have to multiply it by, by 3.7. So we are looking at slightly different units here. Uh, which is the vegetation is about 500 gigatons. Uh, and the permafrost part of the global soils, which is the biggest blob. So global soils have more than 3,000 petagrams, uh, but more than, roughly half of that is actually in the permafrost region, even though it only covers 10 or 15% of, of, of the terrestrial land surface. 1,000 petagrams is frozen. And in this figure, we have another 400 sort of accounted for extra petagrams. A recent paper that came out this year actually brings that number up to 1,000 rather. So this is a really massive pool of, of, of carbon that can potentially be partially remobilized. Not all of this is going to end up in the atmosphere, but even if part of it does, it's really serious for the global climate. Uh, so permafrost emissions were accounted for in the last IPCC report in a way that I think they haven't been in the previous ones. So it's it's really a step forward that it was that it was included. It was not really in the models per se, but it was included based on 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 addition on other literature and uh, and sort of a meta analysis of existing papers. And they conclude that for every degree of global warming, permafrost will add another between 14 and 177 gigatons of CO2 equivalents. So this is both the numbers I'm showing here is both methane and CO2 lumped together and recalculated to a common common unit of CO2 equivalents. And on the bar graphs on the far right, you see uh, how this plays out for different global warming scenarios of 1.5, 2 degrees, and 4 degrees uh, with quite large uncertainty intervals. But the good news is that at least part of these processes, or these numbers, were included in the updated budgets for remaining human emissions. Uh, so the, the sort of budgets that we have coming out of AR6 and that I hope are being used for discussions at these meetings partially include the permafrost feedback. Uh, the problem is that they don't really include all of the processes. If you were to, to earlier you know, talks, you heard more about this, but uh, there are these local scale tipping points where processes that we collectively call abrupt thaw is when massive ice, pure ice that's in the ground that has been frozen for a long time, melts and drains away as water, the whole ground surface collapses and you get a completely new ecosystem. If you're, you know, if you're a person living on top of that ground or if you are biota adapted to that, that's really bad news for you because it's basically change, you're fundamentally changing the whole structure of the system. Um, and this is something that happens gradually over time. You see the graph on the top right here is illustrating how ground ice is disappearing and then you see the ground surface collapsing slowly. The, the photograph on the bottom right shows a permafrost peatland that is collapsing and turning into something completely different after thaw. You're going from this dry surface to a wet surface that has completely different properties and that this post-thaw surfaces also emit a lot of greenhouse gases, a lot more than when you just see gradual thaw of the active layer. So there, are, there, there's a multitude of different permafrost landforms that react and respond in different ways to warming. Uh, there was a synthesis paper recently or a few years ago now that that took a sort of holistic view to try to quantify all of these abrupt thaw landforms and group them into three different classes hill slope failures thaw lakes that form in in, in in sort of more flat lowland tundra areas and peatlands that thaw and form sort of post thaw bogs and then we tried to quantify the fluxes and extent of all of these different landforms that gave us new numbers of, of greenhouse gas emissions from, from these landforms or from these abrupt thaw processes. And it turns out that they almost equal all of the other gradual thaw put together. So the abrupt thaw has the capacity to almost double the permafrost carbon feedback. So if we add this on top of what the IPCC has already been, been including, you see the purple bars there are getting us quite concerned about the level of emissions that we're seeing. On the far hand right of this figure, it was also in the last bar graph you saw, but I didn't mention it then, you have this one line that says the remaining budget for 1.5 degrees, which is a little bit more than 400 gigatons of CO2. So you see that in the high emission scenarios, the total amount emitted from permafrost is actually starting to eat up almost all or a really big chunk of the remaining budget for 1.5. Obviously, this is very concerning, but uh, um, one thing that is really important to point out here is that there is a, there is a mismatch in time in the sense that the 1.5 degree budget is something that we need to close, we need to remove you know, those emissions now in the coming decade, basically. So that is something that is happening today and in the coming 10 years, what's being discussed here today. While the permafrost emissions that we're showing here, they're something that's going to happen 
at the end, you know, they're going to accumulate, but they are not, they're happening over multiple decades or even centuries. So it's not like permafrost thaw is immediately going to close the 1.5 degree window. It's going to come later and it's going to come hard if we don't cap warming to, to, to sort of low levels. Uh, another important take home here is that the difference between 1.5 and 4 especially is massive. So there's, we save a lot of the permafrost and a lot of the emissions by keeping our emissions low in the coming decade. Another potential problem uh, that is especially concerning, I think, if you look at the long-term perspective, is the concept of overshoot warming. So overshoot warming is when uh, if you know, governments don't agree or manage, or you know, governments and society don't agree or manage, to get to our target temperatures directly. So ideally, we'd like to, we have this black line here, that's the target temperature, and we'd like to follow the green line to cut emissions rapidly, stay at the target temperature, perhaps even go down, ideally. But that is perhaps looking less and less likely. And oh, I see that something happened to my text here. But this was supposed to give you the references to all of this, <laughs> to all of the stuff that I've been showing. But you can ask me later if you want references. Then. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I lost track. Uh, if we go back to the overshoot trajectory, that is, you know, where we overshoot the target temperature and then use some type of negative emissions, either be a technology or land use change or whatever, to bring temperatures back down again. Uh, the problem with the natural feedbacks and these overshoot scenarios is the first problem is that because permafrost will drive even further warming, we will actually go even further above. Even the green line now goes above the target temperature. And the second problem is that the vast amount of permafrost that will be thawed while we're in the overshoot warming, while we're higher, it won't refreeze and it, it will actually keep emitting greenhouse gases uh, for several centuries. And a lot of the damage to the you know, the people living there, to the infrastructure, the collapse of the land is irreversible. Once the ground ice is gone, even if the temperature comes back down in this red line, the ground ice is not going to regrow and the ground is not going to stabilize again. So it's not like the houses that collapses, they are not going to reappear. All of this damage will be permanent and the greenhouse gases will be sustained for, for centuries beyond. Uh, so if we add this to our, uh, in, uh, to our bar graphs, you see two versions of overshoot there. If you overshoot by half a degree or if you overshoot by one degree above the 1.5 degree target, you get significantly added emissions over, over the long term. Uh, so if we add all of this up and we look at permafrost together with these remaining carbon budgets, uh, you see the, the, the size of the purple or blue charts are the remaining budgets. And then you see the shaded parts is what is going to be eaten up by permafrost alone at 1.5 and, 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 and 2 degrees. But as I mentioned, this is not going to be happening at the same time. So this does not mean that the actual carbon budget we have in the coming decade is the lower one. It just means that still over time permafrost will emit this, these additional greenhouse gases and humanity, future generations, will have to deal with it. They were, they're going to have to deal with these long-term emissions, presumably through negative emissions or through increased uh, uh, atmospheric co uh, carbon count concentrations over a very long time. Uh, so I've already mentioned this before, but another really crucial impact, uh, permafrost infrastructure, people living on permafrost. This is a recent Google image search for permafrost and infrastructure. And you just see some of the many examples of what can happen to, to the people that, that live, live in the Arctic. Uh, this is from a recent review paper by Jan Joop et al, where they find that by 2050, thaw hazard will affect the homes of 4 million people and 30 to 50% of critical Arctic infrastructure, with costs of just maintaining infra infrastructure alone in the tens of billions of dollars annually. That's not, not more quantified than that. But this is a really, it's in Nature Reviews Earth and, Earth and Environment. It's a re really good paper to, if you want to get a sort of update on the, on the situation. Um, I'm not going to go into details, but here you see this is just subdivided by settlement, railways, and industrial areas. And you see a lot of settlements and railways are in these high hazard potential areas that will be severely affected by thaw. Uh, so we, we have the you know we have the greenhouse gases, we have the the people living on the permafrost, but we also have the ecosystems themselves, the biodiversity or geodiversity, if you want to call it that. But we're also looking at irreversible loss of permafrost land surface and diversity and ecosystems. Uh, this is not you know, the main topic here, but it's still a really important one. Uh, this photograph shows the degradation of ice wedge polygon tundra in the Russian Arctic. And on the right-hand side, I'm showing a map from a paper a few years ago where they show in the 
yellow and red where these landforms are found now and in blue where they will be found in the future uh, under RCP 4.5. 4, 4 so you're also seeing, you know, fundamental, you just see a permanent loss of these ecosystems potentially, at least in some parts of the Arctic. And there are a lot of species that are associated to different types of permafrost landforms that will be without a home in this, in this future realities. Um, so I want to end with, uh, this is from the last IPCC report where they have this nice frequently asked questions set, uh, section where I, I pulled this out where they ask, could climate change be reversed by removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere? Because I think it's really pertinent to our multi-generational sort of approach we're taking here. This is the scenario that they're asking or that, that, that they're asking the question about. If you see a peak and then a subsequent pull down again. So this overshoot scenario. And the, the answer to this question is yes, it can be reversed if you're talking about global surface temperature change. But there will be a lag of a few years and you land at a higher temperature than what you started with, obviously, because CO2 didn't go all the way down. Uh, and then they say that for other systems, it will take decades or even more. I would argue that it should be centuries here rather than decades, because I think the permafrost regrowth in Earth system models is too rapid. It doesn't happen that fast in observation from observational evidence. So you see a regrowth of permafrost and a stabilization, but uh, it would take dec decades or centuries rather before that happens. Uh, and for ad yet other feedbacks, it's not reversible. If you look at ocean thermal expansion as one example, that's gonna keep going for millennia and there's, there's, no, there's no coming back from that, which has implications for long-term sea level rise together with other, other you know, together with, with the uh, ice sheet dynamics and other things that we're not getting into right now. Um, but I also want to, then I want to go back to this slide of permafrost change. Uh, is that, okay, it might be partly reversible, it might be stabilized, but you still have this massive change that the orange bar shows you of, uh, you know, six million square kilometers in this case. You didn't, I didn't show you the, the, uh, the title of the legend, but that's six million square kilometers lost. And those six million square kilometers, they're going to keep emitting greenhouse gases for several centuries. So even if it say permafrost stabilizes, it's bad news for many, many generations of future humans. Um, so this shows just emissions by 2100 and then going all the way out to 2300. If we take the long term perspective and you see that you have really high emissions of up, up to 1500 gigatons of CO2 equivalents uh, in the long term under the four in the in, in the four degree scenario. Um, so sort of summary of my points here on permafrost thaw impacts. So we are already committed to profound permafrost thaw impact to climate, to Arctic communities, to indigenous peoples, to ecosystems that will affect several future generations, regardless of what we do. Uh, and this reduces the remaining emission budgets with strong effects projected by the end of this century and beyond for several centuries. Abrupt thaw processes are really crucial. They create local scale, irreversible tipping points. They transform ecosystems, they damage infrastructure, and they greatly increase warming. Uh, overshoot warming would trigger irreversible permafrost thaw. That would drive additional warming for centuries, even after the climate stabilizes. And we find that global warming is reversible, uh, but many feedbacks will persist for centuries to millennia. And this is a long-term perspective that we really need to have to the negotiations as well. So, thank you for listening. Thank you so much. It's a fantastic grounding um, into the issue that we're talking about and an introduction to the, the implications that this has for both people living in permafrost systems and, um, as you mentioned several times, for, for future generations. And of course, the other side of this coin is um, sort of in this context, how do, we, how do we move forwards and how do we do that in a way that centers um, affected communities, including youth. And so I'm, I'm really excited to um, ask Sumin Han to come up and speak a little bit about her work. Um, Sumin will tell you more, but she is the finance lead at the Youth Climate Lab. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I was gonna say good morning or good afternoon, but I think ever since being at COP, I've lost track of what time it is. Um, I had some slides prepared. Yes, perfect, thank you very much. Shall I just click the button? Well, oh, okay. Sorry. Thank you very much, thank you. 
Well, hello, everyone. Uh, I'll save my introductions for a little bit later as we get into the panel discussion. But I really appreciate being here. Thank you for setting the scientific context uh, as we frame this conversation as well. And as Rachel mentioned, I think it's important for us to identify ways to move forward and also think about what these scientific data means on the ground and how do we center young people and communities uh, that are disproportionately impacted by climate change to actually center their lived experiences and identify solutions moving forward from this. So we, I'm clearly having a lot of problems with this, unfortunately. Do you mind just clicking next slide, please? Ah, perfect. So I'll share a general uh, introduction to, to who I represent. Uh, I'm part of Youth Climate Lab, which is a youth-led nonprofit. Uh, we work globally. However, we are headquartered on, uh, in Canada, in Ottawa. And what we do is we really work to support young people develop climate solutions through policy, through climate finance, and through developing skills as well. So we have designed programs in over 75 countries across the world. We have activated and engaged young people to develop policy solutions. Uh, we have designed programs to engage young people in, in developing different creative ways to look at climate change and how do we activate young people in these conversations as well. So we do a lot of various work and this is a recent uh, program that we had just finished up. We have developed a climate manual um, that is focused on, on northern communities and, and we really prioritize how do we talk about policy. So in many of the, the programs at Youth Climate Lab or YCL as we call ourselves, we run uh, there's a program that we ran called Future Exchange, which really demonstrated the need, the deep need for equipping young people with the skills and resources and understandings of what it means to engage in climate policy in the North. And we really know that we've heard from stories from Indigenous and Inuit youth and living in the North and Arctic regions that we know, they, they see the daily impacts of climate change. They see how it impacts their livelihoods, the way they connect with each other, the way they connect with their communities, their elders. So we really wanted to ensure that as they think about solutions moving forward, that we are providing the tools to think of so, uh, policies as a tool to get that solution and conversation going. So in 2018, we had developed a manual called the Infiltration Manual. So we had worked with different counselors and mayors across Canada to develop ways for young people to get involved in at the municipal level. But we recognize that municipalities are very much of a Southern Canada concept. And the communities in the North, they organize themselves differently, territories organize themselves differently. So we really realized that there was a key need to ensure that we were developing a manual that will support young people living in the North and that it's contextualized and actually localized in the North as well. So we had developed our Aha, Northern Climate Policy Manual. Uh, and we have divided this uh, manual. We're very proud of it. It's over 80 pages long. Um, and it is separated into four key sections. So the first is what is climate change? And then what is pol climate policy? Because I find that you could talk about climate policies, but sometimes that language just doesn't resonate with people. So how do we talk about policy in a way that makes sense for young people, for communities that have less access to those more technical language as well? And then we talk about who, what, and how of climate policy at the federal level. We know a lot of, especially in Canada, there's a lot of jurisdiction you know, issues and, and each jurisdiction has control over other issues as well. So we wanted to ensure that we were getting a holistic view of how do we engage the federal government in these conversations. And then the next chapter that we have is how do we engage in climate policy at the territorial level? And we know that each territory has its unique processes. We know that they run differently than provincial jurisdiction as well. So we want to identify those as well. And then lastly, how do we bring this all together and move forward? So we identify ways to take it to the government. How do you talk to politicians? How do you build a community? How do you mobilize other young people who are also passionate about the same issues? And then we really uh, develop different pathways for action as well. And if you could, if you look on the link here, you'll, you'll find our, our manual. And uh, if you look on our social media, which I'll share later on, you'll see the different ways that we have tried to demystify some of these key concepts as well. So these are some examples of what you'll find in the manual. I won't go too deep into it, but as you can see, we have tried to demystify some of the key concepts. So why is you know, focusing on the North important? What is policy? Why is it important that young people are engaged in policy? 
who are the key actors, what are the key steps, what are the key levers of change that we have not, it's, it's not commonly known. So if you want to bring this issue up to the, your politician, bring it to the various levels of governance, how do you do that? Who do you need to engage? What are some strategies that can be used? And we really tried our best to demystify a lot of those processes and create resources to support young people lead this. We also went into different communities and we have discussed this manual and, and this was really a collaboration effort as well. Uh, and we have chat, we have discussed this manual with young people who are living in the north and we've asked them, there's different, you know, how are you engaging in climate action? How are you using policy to bring about change? So we have interviewed a couple of youth and you'll find that we have uh, harvested different stories from young people. We know everyone plays a different role in climate action as well. So how is everyone engaging in it differently? What are some different ways to engage in climate policy as well? So you'll find on our website uh, that we have different audio recordings of young people discussing how they have engaged in climate action in the North. And we also have written out interviews of how young people uh, have found different policies or actions to be helpful in, in bringing about change. We want to thank our sponsors and our partners and our funders. Um, it, it, this couldn't be possible without them. And, and we really, as I mentioned earlier, although I'm standing in front of you talking about it and I'm representing Youth Climate Lab, this really is a collaborative effort and we wouldn't be able to do this without the trust and the energy that uh, all our partners have put into developing this manual with us. So this is our, our little plug. Uh, we do a lot of different programming and, and I'm sure that we'll discuss more of them in the, as we continue with the panel, but thank you for, for having me share a little bit about the policy manual. Thank you so much. It's a really exciting and really relevant and yeah, really interesting piece of work. So thank you for sharing. Um, before we move into the panel discussion, I'd like to um, invite Lisa Kapokoluk, who is the, um, Vice Chair of ICC um, Canada to, and also a really, really strong advocate for Indigenous people, for youth, and for Indigenous youth. So I'd, I'd love, I'm really excited that Lisa's here to join us, and I'd like to invite her to come and take the podium. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you so much. Um, I'll just explain a little bit how ICC, ICC International works. We have uh, um, four ICC countries and we have a chair. It's a rotating chair among the four countries and our ICC chair is in Greenland right now and Sarah Olsvik, our chair, just arrived uh, last night so she's participating in uh, activities here and um, I'm from ICC Canada and as the president of ICC Canada I'm also vice chair of the international ICC. <laughs> so um, I'm very happy to be here and, and so glad to hear the uh, two previous presentations. And it's, 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 it's exciting to hear about the um, collaborative work being done and learning about permafrost as well and its impacts on the world, the globe. And um, uh, I am looking forward to further collaboration with our communities, the Inuit communities. Um, I think it's wonderful to have initiatives that teach youth about climate. And I think these are very necessary so that our youth will bring on uh, the continued work on climate action. But our Inuit communities, um, uh, in, in our work, um, we want to include them as much as possible in climate action too and uh, to make sure that our communities who are in very remote areas understand what's going on in the world and how uh, world actions are actually impacting the Arctic. So um, we, spe we consider uh, many of our obligations to future generations and these can be understood in terms of the intergenerational benefits and debts that we pass on. Inuit view environmental debt as more damaging than financial debt. As an Inuk, my past, my present 
and my children and grandchildren's future and that of our children is tied to a healthy, sustainable functioning ecosystem. And that's very important to us because our ecosystem, the Arctic ecosystem, the homeland that we chose is very much tied to our culture. Um, when we say that it's tied to our culture, what do we mean? I mean, what does peat moss have to do with us, the Inuit who live in the Arctic, where a huge proportion of the peat moss is? Well, um, I explain it by saying that, you know, we chose the Arctic, we chose to live there, and we founded our culture around the Arctic environment. We innovated, we created, and we learned the sila of the Arctic. Sila is the exterior. It can also mean the weather. But as a person growing up, we grow our sila inside of us to become wise, to become knowledgeable, you become full of sila. You are sila tuyuk. And so our culture, the culture that we created around ice, around the marine ecosystem, the marine mammals, the migration of caribou, the, uh, the winds, the currents, everything we have observed through generations and created a knowledge system around the Arctic ecosystem. And that knowledge is the basis of our culture. So we love our homeland. It's, it's our, it's very much a part of our identity. Yes. So um, that connection to our homeland is what we bring over here. We bring our knowledge to COP27 discussions. We teach the world who we are. Um, that's all based on our knowledge. Um, and we're not just satisfied to survive in the Arctic. People often think, oh, living in the ice is very difficult. Um, how can people survive there? We not only survive, we thrive. And like I just said, we create and we love our homeland. The Arctic permafrost has stored vast amounts of carbon over tens of thousands of years. It provides the firm tundra for our herds of caribou to roam across one of the world's great migrations. It is the natural freezer to store our food. The frozen land has allowed our buildings, our roads, our bridges to be built on solid ground. We could rely on the solid ground, not moving when we create the foundations of our infrastructure. And the frozen shorelines and land fast ice protects our communities and coastlines from erosion by the violent storms that lash our shores. As you may know, there, there is constant wind in the Arctic, but the change in global ch temperatures is bringing severe, se severe weather events. And this is also all changing with the melting permafrost a feedback cycle has been created that emits more stored methane, a dangerous and more powerful climate force at 20 times more potent than carbon dioxide. This creates a vicious cycle of more permanent, sorry, of more permafrost melt. And that melting permafrost also unleashes stores of mercury a powerful neurotoxin that finds its way into the fat of the animals that we, we subsist on and into us. And you may see that there are contaminants that arrived um, long ago now, decades that were residing in our marine mammals, in our fish, and even our pregnant uh, ladies, the women of the Arctic, are advised not to eat the Arctic char, the fish that we love and, and that is part of our daily subsistence. Uh, there are many ways that we're being impacted by uh, the industrial world. Um, 
there's now a lot of uh, changes coming to the Arctic. Um, and part of that is infrastructure and permafrost drop. And we need to take measures constantly now. If there's going to be a, a large building to be built, then architectures, architects must ensure that there is a system put in place before building uh, large buildings and homes so that they won't move as the permafrost thaws. That's kind of standard measure now in our communities. But it requires investment. There's airport infrastructure we must also take into account. Our remote communities have no roads between each other. We travel by airplane and we necessarily build airports and airstrips. Airstrips could be damaged by the permafrost thaw. So that, those are necessary uh, things that we monitor these days. Now, um, the permafrost thaw is a significant threat to Inuit communities and all communities. My community, because we live there, yours, because as the Arctic permafrost melts, it impacts the entire globe, from Montreal, New York City, Mexico City, London, to Cairo, and all communities and cities in between. Damage to infrastructure can have knock-on effects community food security, safety, transportation, health, education, employment opportunities, and culture. The Arctic is the great global refrigerator, as we like to say. It's cooling the planet, stabilizing global ocean currents. This is all being impacted by the rapid release of carbon and methane from deep in the Arctic permafrost. As emissions continue to rise and warming continues, there is an ever-growing risk of tipping points being crossed, leading to non-linear processes and abrupt changes. This includes the rapid loss of polar ice, the release of large amounts of carbon from permafrost, or the, lo the loss of large ecosystems such as the Arctic or tropical rainforests. Practically speaking, these tipping points would be non-reversible. That's what we are leaving the next generation. These climate tipping points may have major implications for inter intergenerational justice. This is a climate justice issue, an intergenerational climate justice issue. I think I'm going to end here because I think we could go on and on and talk more, but um, I'm really um, grateful to be part of this uh, discussion panel and looking forward to questions or comments further. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lisa, for that really powerful discussion of, of those impacts. And I think also for, for transporting us a little bit to the Arctic there for a, for a few minutes. Um, so to move um, into our panel discussion, I'd like to, um, to start off by um, introducing our additional two speakers. We're really happy and um, lucky to be joined by um, Sharon Gaki, who is a member of the youth-led intergenerational action network, Arctic Angels, um, and also a member of the Loss and Damage Youth Coalition and also by Hita Lakani, who is a climate educator and the co-founder of the Youth Negotiators Academy. So two more really exciting um, speakers for us today. And I'd like to start off by asking the two of you just to introduce yourselves in your own words, um, tell us a little bit about the work that you do and perhaps also tell us about your climate story or the climate story of your community. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Sharon Gaki from Kenya. I am a member of Arctic Angels uh, under the Global Choices. We advocate for the protection of Arctic Ice Shield. I'm also a volunteer with Loss and Damage Youth Coalition, and I'm a logistics person in um, Fridays for Future MAPA. 
So about the climate story, I believe everyone has a climate story, but it's more dramatic to the people who are on the front line of the climate change. So I come from Kajiado County, Olosukon sub-county, and my community, it's a pastoral community. Growing up, I've seen my people lose their property due to floods. As we speak currently, our livestock are dying off because of drought. As I'm seated here, I'm thinking of my, my home, which is just a few hours away by plane from here. I'm, I'm worried about my people, my people who are struggling to get a meal at least for a day. My people and my pastoral farmers who cannot feed their livestock and as day goes by, they're just praying if the situation can change for them to keep their livestock because they're just watching them selflessly die and succumb to drought while they can't do anything much about it. Their livelihood has been changed into poverty. Children are dropping out of school. And this is my story. Hi, everyone. I'm Heeta. I'm from India. And I grew up in the very big, crowded city of Bombay, um, which means that I have seen firsthand what development means. It, and it easily means that the environment or our natural world comes at a second priority. Um, I think I must be around 12 or 13 when I was coming back home from school one afternoon. And uh, I live by the coast and we have, they, were make, they were doing a beautification project where they were creating a promenade, a walking space uh, by the sea. And we, it was lined by coconut palm trees throughout. Uh, but to create this promenade, they had to take the trees off. I think they replanted. I'm not sure what they did. They said they were going to replant it. But this visual, I was, I was passing by the road and was about to go home where there was this huge coconut palm tree lying horizontal on a trailer. So its roots were, roots were out. Its leaves were you know, in its full glory. But except instead of standing, it was horizontal. And even today, that visual is very deeply impacted in my head just to see what a majestic tree like that and multiple different trees hundreds of trees that lined the area how they were sort of probably they replanted them maybe they survived maybe they didn't i was too young to really ask these questions and understand but the feeling of helplessness that i felt at that point and i just burst into tears because i didn't know what else to do um and this was what i think for me started to learn more about the environment, learn more about what we're doing, why we're doing this. Today, I've been to way too many of these COPs. I here now as a co-founder of the Climate Youth Negotiator Program, which is a program where we're working with 27 countries in the first cohort, which is this year. And we have 55 young people from these countries who are part of their national delegations, who've been trained over the last five months and are making these decisions sitting in these national delegations along with their counterparts. And in India, I also work on climate education to try and bridge the gap between the knowledge of the international sphere, the knowledge of what we're all talking about here, simplifying that for young people in India through the Climax Foundation. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to have all of you joining us here. Um, so to start the um, start sort of digging into this discussion a little bit more, I want to go back to something that um, Gustav said during his presentation, which was that permafrost emissions will largely perhaps hit later, but they will hit hard. And of course, this is something that aspect is something that has a disproportionate effect on on youth. And on the other hand, we've also heard very powerfully from this panel about the very immediate, very current impacts of climate change and permafrost thaw within the Arctic, but also the impacts of climate change elsewhere. So I just wanted to ask the panel for your, um, your sort of initial thoughts and responses, um, both to do you feel that, that policymakers at COP and elsewhere kind of appreciate the long-term side of that coin and the implications of that for youth? And how do we balance those two issues? How do we balance this immediate urgency and the impacts being faced now with the fact that we also have these longer term impacts that perhaps um, we don't think about so much. And I'll open that to anyone who would like to start.
Thank you. Um, yeah, I think that uh, it seems quite clear that uh, you know, policymakers in in general have it, it. It's really hard to get traction for any problem that's more than a few years or a decade out. Uh, and I feel like the fact that we're still talking about 2100 as in climate circles somehow 2100 has become like the long term, which is going to be that's really far away. But it's not that far away. I think my, my kids are going to be alive at 2100, hopefully. And we need to, you know, we need to, to redefine long term. 2100 is almost upon us. Uh, and I, in general, I would I think that we have the right to demand that policymakers have the ability to juggle more balls than you know one at a time. And in general, we see a trend where as global global crises emerge, you know, focus on environmental or climate issues go down. And uh, we, we've seen it before with cycles of you know economic ups and downs, and then that you know impacts how how successful the cops and the negotiations are. And now we're at a stage where there's a you know there's a war in the Ukraine, there's a potential global economic crisis on the sail up, and again you know climate takes the back foot. And I think that it's just not acceptable that that we are not able to to manage several problems at the same time, but that seems to be the stark reality. Thank you for the question. I'd like to answer it with the Inuit perspective. Um, <laughs> our Inuit leaders uh, had been speaking out over the last three decades on the impacts that are coming to the Arctic. In fact, uh, Inuit leaders have been predicting all along what, what is now a reality. And that took three decades. So why wasn't action taken three decades ago and over the last two decades and over the last decade? Perhaps there is some action being taken, but it's not enough. So we bring our knowledge, Inuit knowledge, to these discussions and they hadn't been taken into account. We, we are the inhabitants of the Arctic. We see what's happening. We've been saying uh, we're the, uh, um, what's it called, uh, the canary, uh, and the canary in the, the coal mine. So, thank you. Um, uh, but, so now we are living a terrible reality. There is a severe hurricane that happened in the west coast of Alaska to our fellow Inuit, damaging their homes and, and their shores. Um, and it's happening elsewhere. The forest fires are impacting our homeland in the Arctic. The melting of the ice is impacting the uh, the global temperature and uh, we are disproportionately impacted by climate change so when are when is the action going to to happen when are we going to see uh, results i think one of the biggest gaps that i have noticed is i absolutely echo what my fellow incredible co-panelists have shared about how climate change is a justice issue. And I absolutely hear what you two have had to share as well. And going back to your point, Lisa, especially, I think one of the biggest gaps is how inequitable our decision-making spaces are. Um, we're discussing changes and impacts that are really impacting some communities more than others. And we know that there are communities that are more, made more dis uh, vulnerable due to climate change. And I think ultimately at the heart of it is because our decision-making processes are inaccessible to those communities because they're inequitable, because they keep people out and they are intentionally designed to keep those communities that are impacted out of those conversations. So I think what we ultimately need is, I think policymakers could be doing a lot better in ensuring that there are opportunities and entry points and spaces and to ensure that young people like ourselves, uh, indigenous communities and Inuit communities that are disproportionately impacted, and for opportunities for scientists to actually have a conversation with policymakers. I think, although we like to think that we're, our policies are driven by science, we know that often that is not the case. So how do we ensure that those people who are speaking up, 
those people who are leading these solutions conversations are actively involved and are, are actually supported and provided the resources and the opportunities to lead those conversations, not simply be tokenized and just be asked to join the table. But again, I think the, the problem is that we're not even being asked to join the table. So how do we get ourselves, how do we create those resources and conversations to get ourselves to the table and actually work as collaborators, collaborators in those solutions as well? So for me, I feel like uh, policymakers have done very little into implementing policies that are may be of benefits into the future generation. In this case, speaking of the future generation and speaking about the youth, we are the youth and the children because uh, they, they forget that uh, these youth are the, the future of tomorrow, are the next generation that you are watching into and forgetting that they are proportionally affected by the impacts of climate crisis. For example, if you walk into negotiation rooms right now, you will find very little youths being represented into those negotiation rooms. And uh, parties as well are forgotten like, to give the, to, to, um, to include the uh, youths and children among their delegations. Thank you. Yeah, I think agreeing with everything that has been brought up already, I think there's, it's very hard when you sit in spaces like this to really sometimes connect with the actual grassroots, connect with the people that are facing the impacts at the front lines. Um, and more often than not, because this is such an imbalanced game when we come to negotiations like this, it's clearly there are lots of different elements at play beyond just the people beyond just the negotiators there are lots of different strings that are being pulled behind behind the scenes so it's very hard or at least it was until the years very hard because most of the countries that did or that could impact the negotiations did not firsthand feel the impacts as bad as the rest of the world but we're seeing that this is changing we're seeing that climate change is affecting everybody now it's already at our doorstep so it's not something that will happen in the next few years and Hopefully this is changing narratives. This is really changing how even the more developed world is thinking about climate change, how they're thinking about fighting solutions. And until it doesn't come to you, I think it's very hard to, to sit in somebody else's shoes and understand how you might be able to solve the problem. So hopefully this is now at this crucial juncture they're actually thinking of how this can be done differently. Thank you. And I want to pick up on a really sort of important point, which I think is being highlighted here about the inequity of, of this and other decision making spaces. And I think, as you were alluding to there, Peter, the, the implications that has for how successful we can be in these spaces. And I wonder if anybody would be willing to sort of um, or comfortable to sort of expand a little bit about your experience at COP so far, how welcoming you found this space, whether um, to Indigenous people or to youth or to other affected communities, and perhaps also speaking to um, others in the room, others here at COP, are there steps we can take or changes we can call for as um, civil society or other communities here at COP to improve that, to make this situation better? Um, so any, any thoughts from anyone who's happy to share? Yes, thank you for the question. I can share a bit. Uh, uh, some of the experiences uh, and activities that I've been participating in um, since the Paris Agreement, there's been a process to an effort to have Indigenous peoples' participation more, more, more involved, more relevant for Indigenous people. Uh, since Indigenous people uh, haven't had a voice at the table, they haven't been part of the negotiation process here. But there is a local communities and Indigenous peoples platform now where activities for um, um, Indigenous knowledge holders as well as training on uh, Indigenous peoples and Indigenous knowledge uh, not just for Indigenous people, but around the whole UNFCCC process occur. So each COP I've been to so far, 
uh, the last two ones, there have been LSIP activities. There's gatherings of indigenous knowledge holders. There's youth, in, indigenous youth, that have been having uh, their own sessions as well. To This is all to connect the uh, indigenous perspective to the negotiation process. And um, through this process, we understand that our voice is being heard more. We can participate in uh, certain um, uh, plenary sessions uh, of opening statements and present our views. And particularly regarding um, the partic equitable participation, um, our basis is our inherent right to our self-determination. And whether we live in specific states as indigenous peoples, or we run our own states, we have the inherent right to, to uh, participate in decision-making processes. And we've been saying this for decades, once again. So it's a slow process. It's a step-by-step -step process where today we can at least say, well, there's this platform where we, we can all gather and, and talk uh, on issues of common concern uh, and um, take part somewhat in a decision-making process. Thank you. I want to maybe spin this question around a little bit. I think the real power really lies outside of those negotiation rooms. Um, yes, we think of these decision makers as having the, the be all end all and really thinking that this is the end of the world if, if those negotiations don't go as we want it to. And to some degree, absolutely it is. And it's really disheartening to see year after year leaving COP feeling really discouraged by how negotiations go, but also I think I've realized um, that the real power actually is belongs to the people and it belongs to civil society, belongs to young people, belongs to indigenous peoples who are actually speaking so vocally in these indigenous people's platforms. Some of the most powerful sessions that I've attended so far at COP has been in those spaces where indigenous peoples are sharing their vision for the world. They're sharing how we can transform the way we even think about climate change what kind of solutions are possible. So I think ultimately um, success really looks like how do we mobilize? How do we bring people together? And I, it's, I think also COP is a way to practice how we take back that power. Um, how do we ensure that we are organizing ourselves that we are sharing resources, that we're identifying new ways and opportunities and collaborations to ensure that we are then actually uh, carrying on that momentum, that we are bringing ourselves together. We're finding new cool ways to connect with each other so that we can move forward together and developing these solutions. Because ultimately, I think we're all here to work towards a more equitable and climate resilient future. And we're not going to get there by depending on these negotiators and, and policymakers to, to get their act right. Because we've been saying these, uh, what's needed, we, we know the solutions. And uh, I think it's really now about taking that power back from negotiators and saying, you know what, we're going to just keep doing the work that we're doing. We're going to keep, you know, vocalizing what we think is the solution. We're going to keep supporting and amplifying the solutions developed by indigenous peoples who are disproportionately impacted. And we're going to keep ensuring that young people have a, a say in these conversations as well. Um, yeah, I think I have a slightly different point of view. While I agree, I think I 100% agree that we need to continue doing what we're doing and we need to continue pushing. But at the end of the day, so I was, we also need to have the people in the rooms. And I want to share a few examples of the program that we've just launched. I mentioned through the Youth Negotiators Academy. We've, our pilot program, uh, program is the Climate Youth Negotiator Program. Um, and we've seen that from the 55 young people that are in the delegation, some of them are actually leading delegations at this point, like leading negotiation tracks at different levels. Um, for example, for the case of Lebanon, for this week, it is a tiny delegation. There are only three people from the Lebanese delegation that are negotiating inside. One is the head of delegation. And then there are two that have been part of our program. There are two young people that are leading. 
and the, for the first three days of the negotiations, the lead was not there because he wasn't here in time. He had worked back in Lebanon. And it was our young people that were sitting in the heads of delegation meetings. It was the young people that were making those decisions along with the other heads of delegations for what Lebanese positions were. And it was really through capacity building, through training, because this is the first COP for both of them. So it's not like they've been here a few times and that they know what to do, but they really needed that additional boost of training and capacity building to be able to do that. Similarly for other countries where they've had massive budget cuts and even senior negotiators have not been able to come. But because we could train and fund a few young negotiators from different countries, they're actually the ones sitting in these rooms today making those decisions on behalf and then coordinating with seniors who are back at home because they've just not been able to be here. So really changing narratives requires effort. It requires a lot and lot of resource and it requires persistence. And if we want to bring in voices of the most vulnerable, we need to give them all of this and we need to open up spaces for them to do so. And it's, it's not always easy to open up spaces. Um, the fact that yes, our youth were there in the heads of delegation meetings is one, but the, the approach is also that the heads refused to acknowledge their presence as an equal because they were just like, you know, you're, this is not your role. So it's one thing to give them the space, but it's also the mindset that needs to change. It is the approach through which we look at people like these communities. And despite having everything that they can when they're sitting there, they're still not being taken into. They had smaller huddles where they were not included in. They've had meetings where they've just not been invited to because they were not the head of the delegation by position. Um, but the brighter side to all of this is really to see that change is coming. Actually, about an hour or two ago earlier today, I was talking to someone who's an advisor to the Fijian uh, delegation. And they were talking about the negotiations and how certain mindsets are just so fixed because it's the same people that have been coming for the past 20 years to the negotiations. And they're just like, the approach is, this is how we do things. And this is how it's going to continue to be. It's very hard to then ask them to think of it differently, which is why we need people in the rooms who can bring in fresh perspectives, people who can shake up the system from the inside and say, it's fine if we did things a certain way, but it's high time that we change and we move to a different way of working. And we're seeing this happen bit by bit in small portions in the negotiations. We've also seen how the youth that are part of the cohort, despite having very different political positions, are now collaborating they have their, of course, they have their own country stance, but they're trying to find common ground because now they're friends beyond just being in the, in the same room. So they actually have a personal connect. And this, I think, is precious. When we come into rooms like this, we forget that we're all people of the same communities. We're all people who understand each other and we can connect at a level beyond just our national positions and beyond the text. And this is precisely what we're trying to shift in through programs like this. And we definitely need more people to come in and more different voices, not just youth, but indigenous young people, also more women, more people of genders, more people of color to be in these rooms, to bring in the different perspectives, to change it from the, from the inside. And then of course, we definitely need to, need to have the push from the outside and continue doing what we're doing from the bottom up anyway. Thank you so much for, for all of your thoughts. And I have uh, one or two closing questions, but I want to take a pause and just um, open open this up this discussion up to the floor. Um, so I'd encourage anybody who has a question for our panelists to just give me a little wave and um, maybe come up and uh, speak into the microphone and introduce yourself and ask a question if anybody um, would like to do that. They will give folks a little bit of a little bit of space to to think a little bit, and otherwise, maybe I can move on to another question, and we can always always come back to this. Just give me a little wave if you if you do have a question. So, um, in in the meantime, um, I have another question about um, I guess here at COP, but also more broadly, there's so many really really powerful principles and approaches that you take in your work that that all of you have have shared so far, and I just uh, wonder how. Um, what do you, what do you think? What would you like um, other communities here at COP, whether Western scientists, um, negotiators uh, in the negotiating rooms, or or others here? What would you like those communities to learn 
from youth advocates um, or from the, the approaches you take in your work specifically, if you could share um, a couple of sort of best practice principles or things that you would really like to see happening more, um, your thoughts on, on that? I think what I'd like to see more is just a little, a, a more open mindset. And I mentioned this a little bit, but really a, an approach where we're not looking at people just based on what we see. For example, we don't look at a young person and say, okay, you're young, you probably don't have the enough expertise or knowledge in this space. Um, or we look at an ind indigenous person and say, oh, maybe because you don't speak English, you don't know what's going on in the room. So I think we need to look beyond what we just see, try and understand that people come from different backgrounds. People come with different experiences. And this is a global problem. We need to ensure that we're bringing all of these experiences on board if we want to find global solutions. And we're seeing small amounts of change. We're definitely seeing more people thinking differently, but we're not there yet. And then there's a lot of work that needs to be done at an individual level, but also collectively in spaces like this to be able to get there. So for me, um, I think this is the first time like uh, United Nations Conference of Parties is having a youth and children pavilion. And uh, that means that uh, they, are, they have heard our voices and they're giving us attention to make our action into climate change. And therefore, I would love them to, as much as they are hearing us, we would love them to implement the policies that they are putting into place on support of youth and children. And as much as they are supporting us, we want to see it. We don't want to see them giving us words and promises alone. We want them to see, to support us and listen to us as we do the action. I think one of the best things that young people do is to bring incredible passion and also be incredibly creative and innovative. Um, at Youth Climate Lab, we use the term radically collaborate a lot. And I think the term radical has a bit of a interesting, uh, you know, context to it. But I think what we really mean by that is try to think of new ways of collaboration. I mean, the ways that we have collaborated and worked so far in developing these solutions, clearly something's not there yet. And clearly we have reach some sort of a limit in what we can do with those collaborations. So what are the new ways of thinking? How can we transform the ways we're ultimately thinking to ensure that we're developing new and creative ways? And that could be through art. So at Youth Climate Lab, we do a lot of art-based methodologies to develop policy solutions, develop different, different ways of thinking about even communicating climate change as well. So um, I highly recommend that we are, I wanna go back. We wanna, we're so good at identifying different gaps and identifying different critiques for different things. But when we ask ourselves, what is that better future that we want to live in? We don't have a clear vision of what that looks like. And I think it's really the lack of creativity that we have fostered in this space that has led us to that. And it, creativity is really a muscle. So how do we actively engage and you know practice our design thinking skills into climate change? Because we need those creative and innovative uh, solutions to move forward to that together and uh, that also means for collaboration as well who have you not worked with why haven't you worked with them why why are we not thinking about collaborating together i mean that's ultimately at the heart of what climate justice is right bringing together movements to think about the connections uh, between different solutions and issues so i think ultimately because this is such a complicated and interconnected issue the solutions also have to be interconnected and creative and innovative very good points, and I really love the idea of creating a, um, a, a children's pavilion too, and for youth, uh, a pavilion. So um, the collaborative aspect is so important in our perspective. And um, I spoke to you earlier about our concept of sila and sila to you, which, which really is... Um, uh, an, um, a significance of 
knowledge to us and wisdom to us. So uh, one of our recommendations coming here to the COP is take our indigenous knowledge into account. And a lot of people um, don't understand what indigenous knowledge is or um, there's an understanding that a lot of uh, policy de decisions must be made around uh, good science. And so um, there's a lot of good research. I'm not saying science is bad, um, but often it doesn't include that indigenous knowledge. Um, as I was saying earlier, we inhabit the Arctic. We know the ice, we know the seas, and we, we observe what is happening as well. Um, and so we have developed these protocols for researchers, for policymakers, decision makers, um, to, uh, to engage with us in an equitable manner, in an ethical and equitable manner. And I think that's where I can actually say now to Gustav, why don't we uh, uh, work together? Um, not only that we share our knowledge with you, but also vice versa. Uh, we learn about what's happening with the permafrost in the Arctic and knowing about it properly engages with us. Um, on climate action and teaching the world uh, what's happening in the Arctic. That's inclusive of our knowledge. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's, that's a really good, good point and perspective. And I think that you know, more, more Arctic researchers should take the opportunity when we're in the field to actually to interact, to learn from indigenous communities, but then also present the science that we have done on indigenous lands back to the community so that it's and I, and I think that there is also a, a great opportunity to do more work with with schools and getting the sort of young people that are growing up in these communities out in the field learning from both indigenous knowledge holders and scientists and you know, all of the relevant knowledge that is out there and really interact with with the kids and school school programs i think are you know, really important to also give the tools and the language to the young people to actually keep keep doing this work Thank you, and I'm excited to see some emerging potential for <laughs> co-production and collaboration. Um, I'll uh, check if there are any questions from the floor, and if not, then we are coming to time, so perhaps I'll just um, ask our panelists to share any additional closing remarks that, that you would like to, and, and maybe also just highlighting anything you haven't already shared about what a successful COP might look like to you. What would you like to, to leave COP um, with? Um, personally, thank you. Oh, oh, sorry, we do have a question. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I just uh, wanted to ask if so. Um, it's one thing to sort of make a table, uh, make a space at the table for um, women and children, but then um, equality requires also, um, you know, for you to recognize the conditions in which everyone functions. So, um, for example, I'll just give you an example. A lot of women can't stay out really, really late because they, you know, have to, their safety issues, they have to go home. So, um, so this is just an example of what do you think needs to change in the UNFCCC COP process for it to be more equitable and just for everyone? Like, what, what kind of changes would you like to see in, like, the way COP happens? Um, yeah, just to ensure that it's inclusive to everyone. I'll put the responsibility on everyone who has funds. Uh, I think, especially with this cost specifically, we've seen how inex inaccessible this space is for a lot of, especially young people, those coming from small developing states and, and small island states as well. And I, I mean, ultimately, and, and this really goes back to what you were asking as well, Rachel, my ultimate message is young people are already leading solutions. We've seen incredible insights from our fellow young panelists here and our uh, incredible 
elder here and, and our scientists here as well that we <laughs> we are doing incredible work, but we need finances and we need support and we need resources to get here. So uh, we're already experts in the work that we do. We don't need a PhD to prove our expertise in this field. So yes, absolutely, UNFCCC needs to ensure that these spaces are accessible, first of all, but also uh, those with funds that we need to make sure that those funds are being shared and that young people are being funded and that indigenous peoples and na uh, nations are being funded to actually be able to have access and be able to come into these spaces and also not have to worry about what they're going to eat or what they're, where they're going to sleep and are they going to, are they having, uh, getting good rest so that we can actually actively participate in these conversations as well. Like my grandmother used to say when I told her she was an elder, I am not an elder. <laughs> That's so cute. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think we, like I say, we are unfortunately coming to time. I wish we, we could carry on this conversation. But so, so yeah, let's um, close with any, anybody who would like to share any additional remarks perhaps what you would see as a successful COP or anything else you would like to share with the audience before we close out. So for me, a successful COP would be when I see the indigenous people, youth, children, and women get included into the decision making and their policies, their demands being implemented. That would be a successful COP to me. If that is not delivered, then it's not a successful COP. Thank you. Okay, well, I think that is a really powerful note to end on. So thank you so much to all our speakers. I'm really honored to have this fantastic panel of expertise and knowledge here with us today. Um, so thank you so much for sharing your time and your energy. And thank you so much for everyone who's um, joined and listened to the event. And we will reconvene, I think, in just 10 minutes for the next session. So thank you again.